Welcome, everyone, to a good place where truth and integrity meet. Every week, I introduce you to thought-provoking and compelling premier educators, whistleblowers, best-selling authors, journalists, activists, and celebrities. And they all have one thing in common. They are people of truth and integrity, and many are considered modern-day heroes. And today, I bring to you an exceptional guest. His name is Roger L. Simon, and I have my favorite co-host of all time, acclaimed author and friend, Donald Jeffrey. So welcome, gentlemen. I'm so happy to have you here. Nice to be here. All right. So I'm going to just give everybody a little bit of a backstory with you. So uh, Roger is an American novelist, respected blogger, and an Academy Award nominated screenwriter. He is the author of 11 novels, seven produced screenplays, and two nonfiction books. He has served as the president of the West Coast branch of PEN, a member of the board of directors of the Writers Guild of America, and was on the faculty of the American Film Institute and the Sundance Institute. His many journalistic articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, Commentary, Real Clear Politics, City Journal, the Washington Washington Post, among others. He has also appeared on talk radio and cable TV as a commentator, and in 2004, he co-founded the pioneering online news and opinion website, PJ Media. He is now its CEO for Emeritus, and Mr. Simon has also been a Hoover Institute Media Fellow. His most recent work, The Goat, was published September 2019. It's a Foss-like story set in the world of professional tennis, and it was called the, his best novel to date by The New Criterion. And the films he's been involved with are The Big Fix, which has made, which was been made into a film starring Richard Dreyfuss, for which Simon, also a screenwriter, wrote the script. His other screen credits include Bustin' Loose with Richard Pryor, Scenes from a Mall with Bette Miller, Bette Midler and Woody Allen, and A Better Life. Simon was nominated for an Academy Award for his adaptation of Isaac Singer's Enemies, A Love Story, directed by Paul Mazursky. And he has been a longtime resident of Los Angeles, but he now lives in Nashville, Tennessee with his wife, Cheryl, and and he is a 4.0 tennis player, but that's only on a good day. So welcome. I want to say thank you again. It's a pleasure to have you here. feel very fortunate. Don't, Don't test my tennis. (laughs) <laughs> Don't test your tennis, huh? <laughs> Life is like a tennis game, you know? That's what I always said. There's a lot of back and forth. So, Roger, to jump right in here, you know, you've had quite the illustrious career and life, for that matter. So where would you like to begin? Well, you should begin with now, which is, uh, you know, I think people should always concentrate on the now. You know, if you start to think about your past too much, you start to live in it, and your your present disappears. Um, that's just the why. Uh, that's why I I enjoy talking about the goat, because actually it, it stands for the the greatest of all time, not not the Billy Goat. And in sports, the greatest of all time is a a popular phenomenon nowadays. But the book is a kind of a warning about trying to be the greatest of all time. It's a it's a it's a, I hope, funny novel that tells you something about what's really important in life, which is something that's very hard to, for a, any of us in our society to understand, because we're told being rich and famous is what it's all about. In fact, we're told that all the time. So, you know, every time we turn on the television or every time we listen to the radio, every time we look in the newspaper, we're being told being rich and famous is what it's about. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it, children, especially, they see that and they want to be rich and famous. And, and living in Los Angeles for as long as you did, I mean, you're surrounded by celebrities and people who are of that ilk that um, want nothing more to have money and have success and, and live those type of dreams. So I, I understand you're from New York since I did research on you. Yeah. And one thing we do need to know is what compelled you to be an author? What drove you to Hollywood? Um, it was very young. I mean, I, I, you know, I came from a family. My father was a doctor, and my mother was basically a housewife. Uh, and they, you know, but they revered authors. And um, I, I, from the time I was very young, I, I, I lived in Manhattan, and I lived on the second floor of this building, and uh, it, it was the last building with a canopy on. Fifth Avenue. It was right next to Mount Sinai Hospital. But if I looked up at the next building, 
way up on about the 14th or 15th floor, I saw this man typing. And I would look up every day when I was a little kid at this guy who was sitting in his apartment typing. And uh, you know, finally, my, my, my mother said, what are you staring at? I said, this guy right, looking up there and writing. I said, who is that? She said, well, that's, his name is Herman Wook. Now, that's the guy who wrote Marjorie Morningstar and the Kane Mutiny and a lot of very famous books. So, it, And I realized that that was an ambition. But, you know, interestingly enough, you know, it, 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 it fights the message of the story, which is, it, yeah, it's a great thing to write. And, you know, there's a famous line from Dorothy Parker. It's, it's lousy to write, but great to have written. Because, you know, sitting down at the, at the typewriter and now in recent years, of course, the computer and spending hour after hour, it can be very arduous and lonely. But the, but, but the real thing is, that if you have a good message for the people, that's what's really important. It's not whether you become Herman Wook or anybody else. I know you're strong. Mm -hmm. And then what about moving to L.A.? So when did you do that? And and maybe I just want to ask you, what were you yeah, first interested young. in? I mean, I moved to L.A. right after I went to the Yale Drama School as a playwright. And uh -huh. I, I, you know, I wanted to go to Hollywood and be a screenwriter and and be famous and make money. <laughs> so okay. so how did you do it? I mean, you actually accomplished it. So when you came to Hollywood in this beautiful place with all these beautiful people, and there's just so much competition, and anybody knows who's been to Los Angeles trying to make it there, it's very difficult because you're all of a sudden, maybe you were a big fish in whatever town you came from, and you go there, and all of a sudden you're competing with the best in the world, the best writers, uh, you know, entertainers, and so I'm just curious how you started to make your mark and, and how, what was the process? Well, you know, the interesting thing about it is that that was a very different era, obviously. If you, you roll back to 1970 or so, you know, the, the society was totally different, and they, and they actually, I was lucky. The chances of making it were better than those days. They really were. I, I wouldn't want to be a kid now. And, and uh, then they, you know, also Hollywood was making better movies, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, and there was more interest in, in things that were creative. Now it's much more of a bottom line business is making things for a global market that, you know, are essentially mostly comic books. So it, it's, it's not what it was. And I, but I don't know how I got to make it so quickly. I, I think it was mostly luck. I have to say, the uh, right person, the right people at the right time, and well, the right product. Yeah, I had written this novel while I was in school still, and the, the somehow or other they got the idea that I had was good at dialogue because there was good dialogue in the novels. Nowadays they don't even read novels much, <laughs> so it's it, it's it's a different universe and. Also, I think that when you're when you're like 21, 23, young, you don't know how hard it is. If you know what I'm saying. Yeah, but that kind of ignorance might be helpful to people, right? You did you didn't know what you were up against. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, you just sort of oh, I want to do. I was driven to do it. Uh, my father said, "Go to medical school." then be a writer, you know, like Chekhov. Of course, there was only one Chekhov. So I, uh, I, w I lived in fear that I would not make it. So I worked very hard. So that, that's part of it. Uh, I mean, look, you have to work very hard. You have to, and also, anybody in the arts has to accept that they're going to get a lot of rejection. I mean, it's just part of it. Mm -hmm. and if, you're not, you, if you can't learn to handle that, then you shouldn't do it because... It happens to everybody except for maybe Steven Spielberg. That's about it. Mm -hmm. And probably it was rejected once or twice sometime 100 years ago. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so what was the first project? Well, it, 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 it took a while. It took a little while. I mean, the first project, I wrote a novel, that, that first novel I wrote called Air, that I wrote while I was still in grad school, uh, was made into a movie that I had nothing to do with. But that's what brought me to Hollywood. And the movie, the movie was terrible. Um, and I was embarrassed by it, even though I had nothing to do with it, because 
it, it, it was a bad thing made out of my work. But I, I hung on, and then I, I started writing these detective novels, and The Big Fix was the first one, and eventually that got made into a movie, and I wrote it, and Richard Dreyfuss started it. That, that launched my Hollywood career, I mean. Yeah, that's an excellent film. I saw that myself. I, I, most people I know have, and uh, that's a astounding piece of work. And what a great, what a great film! As a, a well, un, and we understand that the first film didn't come out quite how you were hoping, but yeah, that's pretty incredible to get that project and to have that made with that with those with that team of people and that actor in particular. Yeah, it was, and it was a group project, and we became friends for life. We argue politically now, but that's no big deal. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into that. We'll get into politics, definitely. So, and I also know, um, okay, so after the big fix, uh, what then? Well, the next big thing that happened to me was I was, uh, I was continuing to write those detective novels that were doing well and getting translated into foreign languages, and, and that was very gratifying. And then the next big movie thing was I, I got a job working for Richard Pryor, with, who became the movie Bustin' Loose. And th that was, a, uh, let's say, an experience and a half. Pryor was probably the most talented person I've ever worked with. And I've worked with a few talented people. But I, if I was asked who was the most talented, he, I would have to say him. Um, also, he was quite crazy, but he was extremely nice to me. I mean, I see he was a very warm and loving person who had a lot of issues. And some of it was wrapped around drugs, of course, as people know. I mean, I worked for him during the time he almost burned himself to death. I wasn't there at that moment, but uh, it was during that part time period. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my co-host, he himself has endeavored down the road to writing and publishing books, and I'm sure you have some questions, Donald. Uh, I sure do. Uh, Roger, it's an honor to talk with you. I'm looking at your resume, boy, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's one anyone could wish for. Uh, as a writer myself, or, first of all, I, I, you know, I. I think you'd probably well, maybe as a successful novelist you wouldn't because you're you're navigating down the roads nobody seems to few people seem to be able to go down anymore. But I I primarily consider myself a novelist and I had a, a novel published by a little publisher in California that's now defunct uh, about 12 years ago. But since then I turned it on fiction and I've had my fourth one is coming out uh, much bigger publishers next uh, in January. So I've been more successful, but I still have this fiction that I consider it my baby. That's what I consider myself as, but I'm having much harder time because I'm I, I'm an old fashioned. I'm a literary fiction guy. I don't go for this genre, this niche stuff that's out there now. How how do you navigate those waters as a serious writer of fiction now? Because I I look at the stuff that's popular, the stuff my wife reads. You know, this mick fiction I call it. You know, this this chick lit and all that. I I I don't understand it. And how how does a serious writer of fiction exist in today's world there's so few readers uh attention span is less i mean imagine somebody reading something by dickens today just it's they don't have attention span for it how, how do you uh, are, really a problem and I, it's affected me i mean uh, i have a uh, i have ADD as well everybody does because <laughs> uh, all these you know social media is very destructive to the mind i think and uh, you know, I got very involved because I started one of the first online media companies in PJ Media, then Pajamas Media, way back at the very beginning of this century. <laughs> Hard to say that. Uh, but um, so I, I sympathize with that issue. I, you know, um, this novel, The Goat, that I just published is the, one of the first pieces of serious fiction I've written in some time. And it took me a lot to get back into it, even though... Um, and for the very reasons you said, the attention span, uh, I, I have written, you know, what you would call straight fiction and genre fiction, meaning to, I had a detective character. But, you know, many fine writers have written in genres. I mean, Raymond Chandler and Ross yeah. McDonald are great writers. So sure. Sure. It, it, it's really a, it's not the genre. I mean, uh, I think that the, the genre writing issue is a commercial invention in a certain way, because certain types of people like to read certain kinds of things, uh, chick lit being one of those things. I mean, they want to read about, you know, uh, rivalries between women, uh, primarily. Exactly. But, you know, women are interested in that. I mean, <laughs> so you got to give people what they're interested 
uh, you're not going to be a writer, a good writer of it, probably, because you're not that interested. Yeah, well, I think I think I, you I, have to like what you write, obviously. But how now? What going to? I mean, I I think we'd all speaking. Obviously, your experience may be different because you're you're a big name. You know, says so, uh, great accomplishments behind you. But someone like myself, my books have sold pretty well, but I I don't make an much money at all on them because the royalty rates are so low and you know one of my books might have it might have sold half a million copies maybe 40 years ago but there's just not that many readers now so 25,000 copies is good but you don't make the kind of money on it so how most is like myself I would love to sell something to Hollywood I'm trying to come up with a screenplay to pitch from some of my fix I know that's the way I'm going to make money on it maybe but how how do you once you get that uh, connection from the first time you sold a screenplay, does it obviously maybe makes it easier because the people know you, they know of your work, but uh, what's, what's the best way for an aspiring person that's trying to sell something to Hollywood to go about it? Well, I think, it, uh, first of all, it's harder than ever in a lot of ways. But the other thing is that uh, I'm the one to ask because I've essentially been blackballed for political reasons. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, you know, the first thing I advise you to do if you were serious about it, well, you know, I, I think that the dream of making money from Hollywood is a go is a kind of a false dream. Um, you know, if you look back at the old writers, you know, S.J. Perelman, who worked in Hollywood, you know, used to write for the Marx Brothers, which is probably a lot of fun, I would imagine. Anyway, <laughs> he... Uh, he used to write in the New Yorker about how the money that he made in Hollywood suddenly disappeared when he got back to New York. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yes, people do make a lot of money, but I think mostly showrunners on TV. I mean, uh, feature films is, is not a way to go now. If, if you're a serious writer, I, when I started out, uh, films were because people were making movies like the Godfather and, you know those kinds of good films, but they they they're not making those now. They most of the better work is in in, in television, and frankly, because there's so many niche markets, it's not as lucrative as it was. And that's what I'd imagine too, because of that. There's just um, there's a, a supply and demand factor, of course. Because I remember growing up, and there there just weren't a lot of releases, film releases. You just waited and waited and waited, and then a, a quality film would come out, and sometimes not so quality. And, and then I just became, I fell in love with art house films, and I don't see a lot of those great films anymore either. You can catch some European ones, but I'm wondering, you know, you can do maybe a Netflix series mm -hmm. adapted into a Netflix series, something like that. And there's a lot of opportunities that would. Be Believe. Also, with Apple expanding into video streaming as well, and they're trying to be, uh, they're trying to uh, uh, work the same way as Hulu and Netflix and all those. So maybe that's one way to do it. But they're definitely just like with uh, artists and musicians. They they their music is showcased on all these apps, and they're getting pennies per play, just yeah, literally right. like eight it's cents. So it really right. has changed. It's very strange. I think in many ways the arts is being destroyed by modern media. I do too. I've always thought that as soon as I saw, as soon as that the people were able to download music and not have to buy albums, maybe in the late 90s, it was, sure. uh, but it was illegal then. It was called, um, uh, what Napster, was that? Napster. Napster, Napster yes. yes. Yeah. Well, at least people, people go to live music. I mean, I, you know, I yeah. live in Nashville, uh, which is one of the centers of that. And, one of the nice things about living in this town is you can go downtown and hear great live music just by walking into almost any door of a club. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah, that is, I know that's... Mm -hmm. But for, for, for the sad thing about the movies is that the mo going to the, the movies used to be a kind of great cultural experience because you'd all go down and want to see, you know, the new movie by Coppola or Fellini or someone like that. Mm -hmm. but, but that those days are gone because yeah, they really are. And, and seeing things at home on Netflix is is fine. You know, you can make your own popcorn and do whatever you want. But but <laughs> it it, does, it lacks that kind of cultural significance. And not only that, the impact of that because when you go into a movie theater, it's huge and the sound is encompassing, and you feel like you're in it and you're part of it. It's it's mm -hmm. just it was an experience. 
Um, and then, you know, ever since I can remember, like when Dolby surround sound came out and then they started doing 3D, uh, it, it was really an experience. There was no distractions, you just go in there. And it was, a, I loved it. It was just something I couldn't wait to do. And it's unfortunate, but I am glad as well as I'm sure you two gentlemen are too, that we grew up in a world where that was something that we could go do. Yeah, no, listen, I mean, I can remember going opening night to see two particular movies that were fantastic at the time. One it was Psycho, yeah. uh, Alfred Hitchcock, and the other was Fellini's La Dolce Vita. I was a 16-year-old kid in Paris, and I walked in on opening night. That was wow. the experience. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, now this may be a symptom of my age, because everybody thinks, oh, it was better then. But actually, it, I think in the arts, it was better then. It really was better than I can honestly uh, say it. Yeah. Um, so I had a quick question. You know, since you lived in Los Angeles and I live there myself, I'm very curious about, because I've got stories for days, so I imagine you do too. So what are some of the most intriguing or interesting events that happened to you in your life when you were living in Hollywood and pursuing this career? You know, the last years of it were so bad. And what's happened to Los Angeles is so bad and awful. That, it, it, that sort of clouds a lot of this stuff. I, w I was going to write a piece for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I didn't write it for a certain number of reasons. But the, but I was going to call it Nostalgia for Smog. Because, <laughs> because, because Los Angeles was a, was a much better city in those days. Even though there were a lot of smog days that you Going out. Any celebrity stories, though? Because it's always interactions with celebrities. Yeah, we want I mean, the dirt. first day. We're the, the first day I live. The celebrities. So that's what we like to know. Uh, Let's hear about your celebrities. The house that I lived in in Los Angeles was lived in by, uh, I found out, uh, Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio. Oh, wow. That's was, phenomenal. That, yeah, well, it, we, the funny part of the story is the funny part of the story is when I bought the house in 1989, I, uh, the, I thought the realtor was lying to me. <laughs> because the, the, the realtor said, oh, you know, this uh, Marilyn Monroe used to live here. And I was, was like, yeah, I, I went, yeah, right. I'm not, paying, <laughs> I'm not paying a penny more for the house for that. Because it was sort of like if you buy a house around the Potomac of George Washington stuff here, you know. Anyway, so I, I said, yeah, right. But then I, about a couple of years later, I, w I was divorced and living by myself there at the time. I, I w uh, there was a knock on my door and a kind of frumpy woman was standing there. And she said, gosh, you know, uh, I see you built this big wall in front of the house. I did for privacy. And she said, you know, could I come in and look around? And I, I used to live here. Uh, you know, I said, okay. She said, yeah, I was, I was writing, so I was looking for a reason to procrastinate. So she came inside, and she shook her head. She said, oh, God, you know, this house, it was oily, awful. It brings back bad memories for me. I was almost bankrupt and divorced. And I'm thinking, I need to hear about this. <laughs> then, then, she said, then she said, thank God the studio came along and rented it for Joe and Marilyn. So uh, I, I was okay. <laughs> Well, then it was confirmed. And, well, then I found out it was really true in a whole variety of ways. But of course, as you know, probably Joe and Marilyn were only married for about a year, so they were. I was sleeping right where they slept, with the same bedroom, and I can imagine there must have been a lot of fights. Anyway, and a lot of love too. I'm sure there was. A lot of love. She was the one who kept going to her grave after she died. Yeah. Right. Um, but he was also legendarily a batterer, so I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Um, but then later on, you can even see it online. The the um, we they, they got the canceled check that the studio paid for renting the house, which was like uh, something like three hundred and fifty dollars a month in the fifties. Of course, this is a house that was rented for eight thousand a month when I was there. But I owned it and. Um, you know, it was an interesting street because a lot of people who lived in that neighborhood were big in Hollywood, including including people who are big in the news now for bad reasons, like Felicity Huffman. What new, oh. what neighborhood was it? Because I know LA like the back of my uh, head. It was the Outpost District, which was really old Hollywood. 
that's, um, you know, the, many of the old smash houses that belong to the silent stars. Like down Franklin, like a little bit east? Up in the hills above that. Above that. Oh, yes. Okay. And um, there were a lot of old smash homes, uh, beautiful ones that, uh, you know, Charlize Theron lived up in there. And I never saw her. Um, <clears throat> How sad. <laughs> Not unfortunate. Still two doors for me. I saw him all the time. But the, but the, but it was a very Hollywood area. But then, as I started, oh, we'll be right back, guys, after these commercial breaks. Everybody, after the break, and right now we are speaking with Roger Simon, who is an American novelist, a respected blogger, and an Academy Award nominated screenwriter. And I also have with me co hosting today uh, the uh, acclaimed author Donald Jeffries. So, welcome back, and I'm glad everyone's still here. And let's pick up where we left off. So, I know we were talking about Hollywood and we were talking about the home you were living in. So, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Roger. Yeah, well, what what had happened to that community, with that area of old Hollywood, was that um, the the homeless have started to live up, up on Mulholland Drive. You know, um, Mulholland Drive being one of the most famous streets in America, really, uh, at the top of the Hollywood Hills there. It's a, there's a Disneyland Drive uh, ride named after it. It's all the old Bogart movies have have, you know, chase scenes on Mulholland Drive. Anyway, they, it, it started, they started, homeless started living in tents up there in the, in the brush. So the, uh, the whole community it became ch- it changed because these people would be coming down in the morning from the hills to the homeless centers. But they, they, they didn't want to live in the homeless centers because those are drug-free zones. And they prefer to live in a tent because they can do what they want. And it's usually... Narcotics. Right. You know, that is, I was going to ask you a quick question before we jumped into politics, which is a huge part of, of what you do, what you, what you think about and how you write, and uh, as well as why you started uh, PJ Media. Um, so what did you see? What was the dark parts in Hollywood? Because I, uh, I saw a lot of darkness. I'm just curious if what you saw yeah. and what I saw were similar. Yeah, the, the darkness, you know, and I write about this in The Goat a little bit. And you see, you know, it, it, it appeals to people's narcissism to such a degree that, you know, people come out there to try to make it and they don't, and most of them don't. And they end up, you know, first waiting on tables as they think they're going to have an acting career. And then it goes downhill from there. So it's a, it's kind of can be a very sad place in the bright sun, you know. Uh, lots of people have written about this very well, back to the days of F. Scott Fitzgerald. I mean, it's just not it's, it's not the healthiest way. No, it's definitely not. We moved because we were ready to start a family, wanted to have a better chance. Because my husband actually is uh, the son of someone very famous, and just seeing being around him and the and the and the children of all these celebrities, it, they were all on drugs. Many of them died from overdosing from from car accidents. It was just it was really unbelievable. With too much money. Uh, and um, no constraints. It, it's really it can be a very sad world. Indeed, I, and I think the reason the homeless thing has grown so great, besides the weather, because if you're going to be homeless, you might be homeless in warm weather. <laughs> is 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 that the people in charge are from a generation where they were very lax about drugs and did it themselves. And so they can't really bring it on themselves to uh, to crack down on it. Of course, there's nothing more destructive for an individual than to be addicted. I mean, that's the end of life. 
OK, so let's jump into your uh, political views here. So you came to Hollywood and you, you know, in the 1990s and you were you were conventionally a liberal. Is that true? Oh, very much so. In fact, I would say back in the 70s and 80s, I was on the left pretty well. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I knew that the members of the Chicago 7, I was like, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, a, a creature of my generation, let's say. Mm -hmm. but, but gradually I came out of it. And by nine, when 9 11 happened, I sort of was shot from a cannon to the other side. So what was the thought process? Is what what were you interpreting or perceiving that made you rethink your political standing? Uh, well, you know, as I've written in some books, it, it, it sort of began during the OJ trial, but I didn't really realize it. The, the OJ trial was very much a big deal in Los Angeles, as you can imagine, it was a big deal everywhere. But there, it was like it was the obsession of the city. Yes, it was. Uh, and. You know, when I was watching, I had been a civil rights worker in the South as a kid, and and when I was watching what had turned over into a kind of black racism to get this guy off, and the, and these self-regarding liberals were going along with this nonsense, it, it disturbed me. I didn't know what to make of it. I was just like, it, it, I found it repellent. And then I guess it prepared the way for 9-11 when 9-11 occurred. I realized that, you know, the American founders were where it was at, not Karl Marx. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Donald's very politically active as a writer, so why don't you jump in? Yeah, I, I am, and I, I feel for you out there in Hollywood. Uh, you know, you're you're kind of a heretic out there with your views no, now, I but I left. He left. Oh, wow. okay. He even well, wrote a book called Blacklisted. I think okay. it's called Blacklisted. Well, when, yeah. when you were there, I mean, I, 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 when your views started to change, obviously, I'm sure it became difficult for you. But I, someone, I, everything I write is controversial, and I, I am mostly a leftist. I'm a populist, but because I hate political correctness and some of the things you were talking about, the OJ trial and things like that. Uh, I I don't get the support I should from the left because I just won't play that identity politics. So, is that uh, uh, trying to write, especially certainly trying to write a screenplay or something? Is it possible now to do something like that that doesn't have liberal doses of political correctness in it? I don't, can you write a politically incorrect screenplay and get it filmed in Hollywood? Not very easily, but you know it's very. But here's the thing. <clears throat> You know, a lot of conservatives complain about being mistreated in Hollywood, but the truth of the matter is everybody's mistreated. That's one thing. Secondly, secondly, um, there could be more interesting movies on the on, on the center right side. I'm not very extreme right at all, uh, but the financial people in on the right don't invest in the arts except for the local philharmonic. But Beethoven doesn't need help at this point. I love Beethoven personally, but it's it, 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 they, they, all they want to do is have their name on the, you know, the lobby embossed at the local Philharmonic. But they don't invest in in plays, movies, and things like that that are uh, much more relevant to modern audiences. So it, part of the fall of that is the right. They could have built the, the audience is huge for for their material. But they, they and they leave money on the table by not starting their own creative institutions. Yeah, I've heard that before. And I, I think I think that's true. They kind of uh, give that like they, they don't they don't go there like they just assume that uh, there's no point in even attempting to to uh, to go anywhere in the create. And I and that ends up what does that do? That ends up giving uh, basically free reign to the left. And, and unfortunately, in these days, more and more outrageous you know when you get things like uh you know, the entire 57 genders and that kind of stuff uh people identifying as other races and trees i mean this stuff like that that no one you know a liberal you talked to a liberal 50 years ago they they, they would they would not believe what you're talking about what what do you mean yeah. you know there's jfk would be a republican right now yeah 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 so the the, the <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, but, but part of it is that I, I, I fault the conservative financiers because I think they're snobs and they're very square. And uh, because they're, 
they they've abandoned it. It's it's their fault as much as the left's. No, I I, th- I, th- I think you're exactly right, and they're they're also a little too. Uh, and doctrinaire, I think, in their in their uh, in their beliefs as well. And and but I, I before we got into politics, I, ha- I had to ask you. I, I don't know if you're doing this, but it's, uh, I have a lot of gossip thing in me too. I always I, I like juicy stuff. Is there did did you when you were working with these people in Hollywood and some big names, obviously? Did you can you tell us like who was really nice to work with, and more importantly, who wasn't nice to work with? You know, people love to hear that. Uh, well, yeah, the people that I worked with that were nice. Well, uh, Paul Mazursky, the director whom I worked with a lot, was a very close personal friend. So, I mean, obviously, I liked him a lot. And, you know, one of the sad moments in my life is when he died. Um, you know, Richard Dreyfus, I got along with very, you know, we've, we've argued, and, and he's a He's not his own character, but he's a great guy. Uh, you know, the, the ones who were famous that I liked a lot, and I like Richard Pryor a lot. I liked Angelica Houston a lot. Um, there was a two that come to mind quickly as people. I think they're both really interesting, sensitive people. You know, great artists sometimes are, often are. Uh, yeah, I don't want to talk about the ones I thought were really, you know, Bad. I just don't. <laughs> I, I don't want to do that. Taking the classy approach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just it's bad karma. You know, I, if I saw you, and you know, if we were sitting down to have a coffee together. Yeah, I would tell you, but I don't want to put it. Out. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. I understand. I understand. Well, you know, one thing we can talk about, because you definitely have some strong opinions. I'm looking at the PJ Media site. Mm -hmm. And so the most recent article is, the evil party earns its name with shameful impeachment attempt. So you still have strong opinions about the Democrats, I see. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I was a Democrat for many years. No, I think, you know, the the old expression is the evil party and the stupid party. That's exactly. Yes, yes. (laughs) And, you know, I think the evil party right now is being particularly evil, but they're obviously in a tremendous panic because uh, the investigation going on by John Durham is going to send a lot of their great friends to jail. So uh, what what went on at the beginning of the Trump administration is unparalleled in American history. Unparalleled. I mean, the attempt to... to to uh, you get him kicked out before he was elected and after done by, done by people in the State Department, the CIA, Brennan and all those people, is, is going to be, there. hold your breath, because it's all being, I know from sources, it's all being lined up and it's going to make this impeachment thing a sideshow, although the, although the media will do its best to pretend it's not true, it'll be so strong it will be true. And there will be people from many high places going to jail. It's never happened before in this way. It's a good thing you're not out in Hollywood. You wouldn't have many, fr- many friends <laughs> right now. Oh, sure. yeah, yeah, they know what I think. That's why, you know, but they, they're, they're in for a real, they're not going to be able to handle this. Yeah, what do you think? I mean, I, I talk about Trump a lot, obviously, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm one of the few people that, you know, I lose friends on both sides, but, you know, because I, I don't, you know, I don't hate or love his personality. I just kind of accept it for what it is. But what do you think is going to happen post-Trump? I mean, I don't think he's going to be impeached, but Trump has changed the, uh, the political landscape like no other figure in my lifetime. What 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 do you think will happen after Trump? Because the country is so divided, and it's basically along those lines. It's not the Mason Dixon line anymore. It's the Trump line. It's completely divided. I've never seen. It's you know people talk about potential for civil war. It's it is going to break down on basically how they see these cultural issues. I, it's kind of interesting because this is the ultimate version of can't, can't the old question the old cliche about can't stand prosperity. Yeah, I mean you, the stock market is at all time high right now. Uh, today it's going through the roof. Uh, uh, unemployment is at all time lows for black people, particularly. So the whole thing, 
I, I think that the people on the left can't stand that because they all live with this fantasy that socialism was a solution. But so I look, I, I was that way. I was pretty to the left. And I, I've been in the Soviet Union several times. I had friends in the KGB. I was in China in 1979 before Westerners were there when everybody was in Mao suits. So I can tell you that socialism leads to death and it's a nightmare. And freedom is the way to go. I'm basically a libertarian now. And, and I, I'm pro-gay marriage, all those things, freedom. And uh, that, that's what it's about. And Trump is that way. If you listen, I remember hearing Trump on the radio, on the, on the Howard Stern show in the 90s. He, he was pro-gay marriage way before Hillary and Obama. So they, those are things that they can't stand. Because they don't. I mean, yes, he's changed politics immensely. I'm a big fan. I yeah. Do I wince sometimes when he says things that sound stupid? <laughs> yes, but then I realize that they weren't so stupid. A couple of days later, I mean, do you remember when he said right in there that he was being spied on? Well, now we know. Not only he was being spied on, there was a massive conspiracy. So it's at least this book that just came out, which number one uh, on Amazon is worth everybody reading because in detail, it's got everything. I mean, it's kind of mind blowing. And so, you know, yeah, he changed things. Um, but I think he changed things for the better. We'll see. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm also, you know, I'm for free markets, you know, they, they work better. <laughs> That's be true. Or any of your old contacts in Hollywood though, that you may still be in contact with. I mean, you mentioned Richard Dreyfuss. I mean, I know his politics obviously aren't in that direction. But are oh, there? But, an yeah, he's a little bit more that way than most of them are, actually. Yeah. Or, 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 or is there anyone that you worked with out there that, I mean, we know, uh, I guess there's Clint Eastwood and uh, James Woods and people like that, but is there anybody else in the entertainment industry that's willing to go out on the record and support oh, Trump or they tell you that? Well, there used to be, it's kind of defunct now, a big organization called the Friends of Aid that was all, that's, there were a lot of people, but they weren't, they weren't that prominent, you know, uh, some were, but mostly weren't. James Woods, I mean, is a fantastic actor, uh, but uh, they don't use him anymore. Eastwood is so big that, you know, he's bigger than politics. You know, he's just a national icon, and yet, you know, so they're, they're afraid of him, um, as they should be. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't have any, you know, Bruce Willis is a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a friend of the right. There are others. I mean, um, Vince Vaughn is a complete libertarian. Yes, yes, yes. He was a, so he was a supporter of Ron Paul. Ron Paul wrote the foreword to my uh, most recent book, by the way, so I'm very proud of that. <laughs> Very well, good. Well, what compelled you to do PJ Media? It was just really, just you. You really, for the first was time, was that? It was an accident. It was an accident. Was, yeah, his was, yeah, you know, things like that happen by it's sort of by accident. What I mean is, uh, I had a novel coming out from Simon and Schuster at a, at the time. This was like '03, and. Uh, I noticed that they were, it, it was one of my Moses Wine detective novels, but it, the, the formerly leftist Moses Wine was questioning his old views. And, and uh, I could tell the publisher didn't really like that. <laughs> so I said, oh, I, I'm on my own to get this thing publicized. So I, <clears throat> I had been reading this blog, Instapundit, which was very good, one of the first ones, you know, and I said, well, maybe, uh, you know, author websites are just boring, you know, do the same thing every time, read my reviews, blah, blah, blah. I, I thought that uh, maybe I could uh, do this blog thing, you know, make comments every day. And, and so I did, and I thought that would promote the book. It didn't, but it promoted the blog. The blog became hugely successful uh, because I was talking about political change and how it, those were, that was an era a lot of people were doing it before they went back again, because it was right after 9-11. And uh, I started 
started to relate with a lot of the bloggers, and we said, let's try to make some money out of this. That's how it happened. And now one of the interesting things was that what the interesting thing was the original intention was to have, after we got a finance, was to have um, commentators on the right and left uh, arguing in a collegial manner that fell apart in six months. You want to know why? The writers on the left demanded more money than the writers on the left. Interesting. Hmm. Um, that's ironic, actually. <laughs> it seems ironic, but it's actually... I, I just looked it up. You know what Rachel Maddow gets paid annually? I have no idea. A million? Seven million. Oh, wow. wow. She has no audience either. She gets like 200000 on a good night. That's, that's yeah, not my yes, <laughs> but, 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 I mean, power of the people, right? Okay. <laughs> so then what do you have planned um, for the future? Any projects in mind? Any writing endeavors that are appealing I, to you? I write columns constantly. And, you know, um, I'm, and I'm involved with a company with my wife in the higher education area. And we are going to make public in about, I would think, six months or so. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm very busy in my seventies. And how can people uh, purchase your book? I know you self-publish and it's available on Amazon. So do, do you any other details you want to share? Yeah, they can go to Amazon and get it. I, it's exclusively on Amazon because it's on Amazon Unlimited. On, on Kindle Unlimited, it's the only way you can get that. And that's a very interesting program. So I decided to go with this. The first time I've self-published a book out of 13 books. But it's selling away. We'll see what happens. Uh, one of the reasons I did it is I like the idea of keeping my own copyright, not licensing it to anybody else. So a libertarian in me. <laughs> there you go. And as well as that kind of seems to be the way that it's going. Many people are self-publishing these days. As I, I read that you had said that yourself. Yes, and I think more people will. I mean, it, it, it's a challenge. I, I had a, an advantage in it because I have a pretty big internet presence. Um, people without that, I think it's probably a struggle to get get uh, recognized. The other, the, uh, although they do better if they, you now this is what the, uh, your partner was talking about um, genres. I think that, that unfortunately the self-publication business encourages genre writing more than you know, uh, regular fiction because literary fiction or whatever what do you want to call it. Because for the simple reason that there are genre fans and you can say, well, oh, I, I write just like Agatha Christie. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, but they, want to, it, they want to pigeonhole it, you. True, but it gives a person a hook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And then, um, what, okay, regrets. What regrets did you have uh, during your career? <laughs> uh, everything and nothing. <laughs> uh, what's the great song? Makes sense to me. <laughs> Edith Piaf's great song, Rien, Rien de Rien. I, I regret nothing, you know. To rien, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, I don't really. Uh, I, I think some of the regrets were, I, I didn't do as good a job directing. A couple of times I directed films, and I, I didn't do as good a job. I, I, I think that I'm too collegial. I think the best directors are uh, better dictators than I am. Well, there's always a chance. You never know in the future that's something you can do and, you know, try. It's like anything. It, it takes practice. You know, but, uh, you know, I'm in very good shape for my age. I work out. I play tennis. But it's <clears throat> at a certain point, you don't want to have to get up at 6 in the morning and get to the movie set. That's right. <laughs> that's <laughs> I, mean, true. I, I remember talking to other people who were directing that. Uh, asked, What's the most important advice you could give me as a beginner? And they would say, make sure you're in bed by 10. There you go. And like Donald, I'd like for you to be able to maybe share a little bit about your books. And then if you'd like to see my interviews, you can just go to www.agoodplacewithella.com and you'll be able to see uh, the, the ex exclusive videos and the amazing guests that I've had to have the luck of interviewing.
Uh, wonderful. Well, my, my new book is Crimes and Cover-Ups in American Politics, 1776 and 1963, The History They Didn't Teach in School, forward by Ron Paul. Uh, it's out by Skyhorse Publishing, which is the division of Simon & Schuster. And I uh, hope uh, so far it's getting uh, good reviews, which is uh, amazing considering how controversial most of the material is. And it's, uh, I, I hope uh, people will go ahead and check it out. Yeah, we still have a couple more minutes. I just want to say, people, I really hope that people listening will uh, start to revisit books. I just think that you can't replace yeah. a book. It's just, it's really a shame. And I do love audiobooks because sometimes this is just a busy, busy world. So um, I remember I, I messaged you the other day, Donald, about make, I wanted to make sure you had a book on audio. So yeah, I always yeah, appreciate yeah. when something's on audio. Just, it's a busy world. It really yeah, that, is. Fair. The Goat is coming out on audio momentarily. They, they, Great. It's, Great. It's been recorded. Um, I, I approved it. I didn't record it myself because I just don't want to read it all over again. Oh. And, uh, but a very good pro did it. And, and they... And uh, it, I, it, I'm looking every day on Amazon. It should be popping up there quite shortly, and also on Apple and all the rest of it. Uh, I, I don't do. I don't listen to audio books myself because I'm not, I try not to spend that much time in the car. Well, there's also like when you're, you know, for me when I'm drifting off to sleep, I put in a little audio book. You know, with the earbuds. You know, there's always ways. If you want to read and you want to hear books and you want to listen to literature, there's a way. Sometimes. I bet. And, yep. But reading, always reading a book is the only way to, really to keep your mind calm and sharp. Yep, to keep it sharp. And then also to have the opportunity to, to go on an adventure with a writer. And so, again, I'm going to promote reading today. That's going to be my little lesson here. <laughs> and, again, thank you guys so much for coming. We just have a few more seconds. And thank you to this amazing station with these amazing owners at truthfrequencyradio.com. Thank you.